Hello there, Drew Hannish of Whiskey Lore, and time for another whiskey tasting. And uh, I've been doing a lot of research here of late on moonshine and the whole time period of Prohibition and getting deep into the stories of moonshine and the moonshine culture and learning things like, you know, the difference between a moonshiner and a bootlegger, moonshiner, manufacturer, sometimes salesman, bootlegger, basically transportation, getting it out to the market. And there are a variety of types of bootleggers. Actually, in the what I was reading, they were talking about how your large bootlegger was basically dealing with large supplies, would never really deal with anything under a quart. Whereas you had these guys called hip pocket bootleggers. And what they would do is they were the local guys who would have just like little pints that they could keep in a jacket and they could be walking along and they'd meet strangers on the street and they would be able to sell this moonshine to those people in the street. And that was a very dangerous job because they were selling to people they didn't know. And so they could end up easily being caught selling to a federal agent and boom, there you go. Now, the thing is, they didn't carry a lot of whiskey with them, so they probably wouldn't get as bad a sentence as somebody who was a larger bootlegger who was, you know, selling large quantities of stuff. But, um, so probably maybe a little easier for the local guys to get off. But the bigger bootleggers didn't tend to get caught as much. And that's mainly because they knew who they were selling whiskey to. Now, I grew up in Asheville, North Carolina, right on the edge of the Great Smoky Mountains. And so I was familiar with some of the stories of moonshiners and, you know, meta moonshiner. I've been to some of the distilleries. There's a distillery that I went to in uh, Tennessee, right on the state line, Tennessee, North Carolina, called Bootleggers. And, you know, they are generations of moonshiners. Uh, in fact, he was talking about a moonshine still that is on the government's property in the Great Smoky Mountains that was his grandfather's, and they can't move the thing because it's on federal land, but you can go visit it if you want to, because it's still out there somewhere. So this is fun stories that go there. So one time when I was driving through, I'm not a big moonshine guy, but, you know, mainly because to me, moonshine, because it's not aged, usually has those youthful characteristics to it that kind of dissuade me from enjoying a particular beverage. So in the case of, you know, if I drink a whiskey that's somewhat young, I might get kind of a yeasty character and maybe more of a corn flavor than I might like. And so I tend to sort of hide away from those. But I found a corn whiskey. I wanted to do this tasting with you because I've been doing this research on moonshiners. And this is a really interesting story. And what's funny is, I didn't even pay attention when I bought this and I was enjoying it. And I didn't really ask a lot of questions when I went to the distillery, which is the old Tennessee distillery in Kodak, Tennessee, right off of I-40. It's actually the main road to get out to uh, Sevierville and up to Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge off of I-40. So there's signs for it all over the place. As you get past all the old smoky signs, you will see some of the... Uh, old Tennessee signs there as well. And so I stopped in, I enjoyed my visit there, tasted some moonshines and said, and sampled this and went, oh, that's really nice. So I will take it with me. Uh, it wasn't long after that, that I finally saw the movie Thunder Road, because this is called Thunder Road, a premium American corn whiskey. The Mitchums. <laughs> On the road. Now, if I read that a little bit closer, for some reason, I just, you know, we sometimes we get bleary-eyed and, and, and really not paying attention to the finer 
details in something, it all came together to me all of a sudden. It's like, Mitchum's? Wait a second. Does Robert Mitchum have something to do with this? And then you flip it over and it says, uh, in 1957, my, fa my father, Robert Mitchum, asked me to appear with him in the movie Thunder Road. We went to Asheville, North Carolina to begin filming. During that time, I met many fiercely independent folk who viewed making moonshine as an expression of American independence and freedom, which is something that in all of my reading and, and officers talking with moonshiners, some becoming friends with these moonshiners, they said, you know, the moonshiner previous to prohibition was very simple and they were mountain folk. They did not make a lot of money off of making moonshine. They just did it and they did it because they thought that it was their right as an American to make whiskey. They never felt like they were breaking the law. That that was just the way that they lived. And during Prohibition, it became a lot more aggressive and there became new moonshiners that came in who weren't of these old traditions. And you started getting some stuff that was of questionable quality and greed got involved in it. But still, your very traditional moonshiners stayed simple. They let the bootleggers do all the hard work. And uh, they just, uh, what they had to do was just make sure that wherever they were making their moonshine, they weren't getting caught. And um, they had some really interesting systems. They would, uh, they would have people on the lookout and they would uh, fire three shots in the air. And that was to alert uh, any potential moonshiners in the area that there were revenuers nearby and then they would the next person down the line would hear the three shots so they'd pull their gun out and shoot three shots in the air and next thing you know guy down the road also hears the three shots and he's throwing three shots in the air and they said it could go on for 15 miles that every moonshiner within 15 miles knew that there was a revenuer coming through and that they needed to get their stills either dunked down in the creek or covered up with brush or whatever they had to do uh, to, <laughs> to be able to avoid being arrested. And interesting too, um, it reminds me of something. I was, while I was on my trip to Spain, I was listening to an audio book by one of my favorite authors, uh, David McCullough, and it was about Americans in the 1830s going to Paris and trying to understand the old world culture. And one of the people that went was Samuel Morse. And Samuel Morse was, uh, went there as a painter. And he's the guy that, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but he wanted to show people what art was in Europe. And so he couldn't just take a photograph. So what did he do? He sat there and he painted it, all the paintings on a wall in the Louvre, recreated them all within one big painting and brought that back to the United States so people could see what those paintings were like. But while he was there, he was curious about something. The French had developed a telegraph system and their telegraph system was basically they had beacons that they would set up about, you know, five, 10, 15 miles apart and they would flash messages back and forth. They would flash the message. So if you wanted to tell somebody all the way across the country something, you could tell this telegraph tower, they would transmit it to the next tower who would see it, transmit it to the next tower and get the message to where it needed to go. And so when Samuel Morse came back to the United States, what did he do? But he invented Morse code. So now you know, and the world of telegraph. So anyway, side item there. I'm going to do a tasting of this Mitchum's Thunder Road. Uh, it's amazing. You see how my brain works. It does a twist and turn through 600 things before I actually get to the thing that I'm talking about. But apparently, and I didn't really finish reading this, uh, I was talking about how every year after... Robert Mitchum had done this movie with his son, 
who was 17 years old at the time and actually plays his brother in the movie. That's an interesting trick. Um, every year after that, at Christmas time, a liberal amount of moonshine would magically appear at my father's home, and he would proclaim it the product of American individualism. Um, so Jim Mitchum, he's, his name's on the back here, and so the Thunder Road Distillery was the name of the distillery, and then it changed to Old Tennessee Distillery, but they still sell the Mitchums, and this is a 50% ABV, 100 proof, uh, moonshine. If you haven't seen the movie Thunder Road, I highly recommend it. I was reading a review on it to kind of refresh in my mind some things about it. And having grown up in the mountains of North Carolina, I think the one thing that I really appreciated about that movie, but it didn't really set out in front to me, but this writer made a point of it, is that it really shows more of a respect than a lot of movies do for Southern culture and that East Tennessee uh, or Western North Carolina mentality. And so it, it didn't play down. It really made, you know, got you into their world and seeing things through their eyes. And it's not a movie that is based on a real person, although they think there's a person it may have been related to. Uh, Rufus Gunter is the man's name. And I won't give away the end of the movie if you haven't seen it, but Rufus ends up um, crashing his, his car into a lake at Christmas and his body isn't found until February of the next year. And so uh, the ending of the movie is different uh, than that. And so that'll leave it, leave it open to you. But Thunder Road was apparently the name of the federal operation for getting moonshiners. And yet the moonshiners or the bootleggers the, took the name and used it to... Uh, as, as a way of describing their uh, travels from Kentucky down into North Carolina and Tennessee. So really interesting and, as I say, really enjoyable movie and one worth checking out. So like most moonshines, and yes, this is this says whiskey, so I'm going to take them at their word that they've stuck this in the barrel for at least a, a, a second. Um, but it is much, much more moonshiny than it is whiskey. It's, it is corn whiskey, so uh, I don't know the mash bill on this. I'm going to assume that it's probably 95% corn at least, and um, the corn does come through quite a bit. That yeasty note is there on the nose, but it also has a earthiness about it, which is really, really interesting. And a lot of citrus coming in on this. Cheers. It actually has a very decent mouthfeel to it. No barrel activity, but it somehow has come up with a medium mouthfeel on it. It's really interesting because the citrus is definitely there. The corn isn't, it's not as prevalent as you would think it would be. It is there. I get black licorice. I actually get black Twizzlers out of this. Um, I get a little chocolate that comes through here. And then I also get that citrus note. And it's peppery. And so maybe there's a little rye in here as well. I, in fact, it would make sense to me. Maybe there's a little rye in here. Where's that peppery note coming from? And, um, you know, I, corn whiskey, I think, has to be 80% corn. To be a corn whiskey, I have to go look at my rules on that. I don't drink a lot of corn whiskey, so it's hard to hard to remember. But um, yeah, so it's really, really interesting, uh, that flavor that it is 
got so many different flavors going on in it because you think corn whiskey, okay, this is going to be very one dimensional. I think of things like mellow corn, which to me is spent some time in the barrel and it really amazes me how little dynamic there is to it. Whereas this actually has a good bit of corn whiskey complexity. <laughs> We won't put it that way. I don't want to. I don't want to say this is on Scotch level or on the, you know, a, a rye whiskey level in terms of complexity, um, but it really is. It's nice and clean. It is an enjoyable drink, and this is probably the only corn whiskey slash moonshineish thing that I probably could drink this way and just be really happy with it. I think it's a, a very nice drink. So if you're ever by Kodak, Tennessee, if you're heading to the Great Smoky Mountains, I'm telling you, it is the number one national park in terms of visitors. So people go there and you may be going, I'm going to Gatlinburg, I'm going to go to Sugarlands, I'm going to go to Old Smoky, do it. You know, go in, enjoy those places. But you might want to stop by and see Old Tennessee as well because uh, um, that is some really impressive juice right there. And um, I've talked to the distiller over there and, you know, he talked about a lot of different stuff that he is doing in terms of working with um, making different types of whiskeys. So, uh, so give that a, a check while you're there. Uh, meanwhile, I am... Actually, right now in Kentucky, <laughs> I recorded this ahead of time. So uh, I'm doing my Irish whiskey presentation tonight. So that's why I have the same time I, I, I had two days ago because uh, I recorded this immediately after. But um, I, I hope you guys, if you're in Kentucky, come out and check out the presentation tonight at the Rippy House in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. Uh, otherwise, have yourself a fantastic evening and uh, if you enjoyed this video if you learned something um, share it with your friends give me a like if you like and um, subscribe if you want to watch more of these down the road until next time cheers and see you down the thunder road chocolate note on the palate fascinates me. It really, really does. This lemon, a little bit of orange, yeastiness is there, and then that black licorice comes in. Really interesting.